So it is my great pleasure to introduce Shelly Spriggs, the Wildlife Program Manager at the Laguna Foundation. She leads wildlife studies along the Russian River and at the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Thank you so much for joining us today, Shelly. Thanks, Milo, and hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Shelly Spriggs, and my pronouns are she, her, and I am the Wildlife Program Manager for the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation. I'm calling in today from Coast Miwok land, specifically the Alagwali Triblet, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that wherever we might be calling in from today, we are on stolen land. So let's take a moment to recognize our local indigenous peoples as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. So if you know the name um, of the indigenous people in your area, I invite you to share their name um, in the chat. And if you don't know yet, then I hope you will take this as an invitation to learn more. So, okay, here we go. Um, I wanna start off with the big picture. So my work right now is about studying wildlife and wildlife corridors. And what is a corridor? Um, a wildlife corridor is often like a patch or strip of habitat that allows wildlife to safely move between these larger blocks of habitat. So I'm particularly interested in habitat connectivity and permeability which means I'm looking at how animals move through a landscape. I'm studying relationships, looking for patterns, um, identifying barriers to movement, um, and also making recommendations for improvements. So why is this important? Why do animals need corridors? Well, one really important reason is access to resources. And that might change um, throughout the year or even at various life stages for different species. So um, really important to have that movement. Other reasons that animals need corridors is the meeting up with mates, um, moving to denning or birthing grounds, dispersing, um, dispersal. So like dispersing from parents, juveniles that are leaving to go establish a home range of their own. So not only is it important for these animals to be able to move the individual animals, but it's also really important to have corridors for genetic diversity to actually allow for the movement of genetic material between populations. I absolutely love this work and it is incredibly important to me to be able to study these animals uh, to learn from them, to support them in the least invasive way possible uh, using methods that have minimal impact, which is also important because I don't want to influence their behavior while I'm trying to study their behavior. <laughs> um, so a big part of this work is using motion activated wildlife cameras. So um, I have one, ooh, I have one here to show you. And I'll hold this up. So here is a wildlife camera and I'm gonna open it so that I can take this little cover off. And so this portion here um, is where you could program the settings of the camera. Most of them can take photo and video. Um, some can do both, some are either or. They're battery operated. So there's a little battery compartment down here that tucks in. And then they also just kind of take a regular um, SD memory card, like the same type you would put in a handheld camera. And that's how um, we collect the information that the camera's captured. I wanna tell you a little bit about how it works. So this part here is actually the camera lens. So this is the part that's taking the photo or the video. Um, this part down here is the sensor. So this is detecting heat and motion. So when there's something warm, like an animal's body, <laughs> and there's also movement, that is gonna be detected by the sensor and let the camera know to go ahead and capture an image. And then these parts here, these are actually the flash. So these are black LED lights, um, and it's enough light to be able to capture a really good nighttime image. It's gonna be black and white photo or video, but it's really good. And it's actually a lot less jarring for the wildlife than a traditional camera flash. I think you can imagine 
you're outside in the dark and your eyes have adjusted and there's like a traditional camera flash versus maybe turning on a black flashlight. Um, so lower impact to the animals, but really cool, um, incredible technology that we can capture all these things. And so these are often called camera traps. <laughs> um, and so, you know, like I said, the least invasive way possible, we're not trapping the animals, but we're able to sort of trap this photo of them. And so there still is some skill that's required um, depending you know, determining where to put a camera, what location is going to be good. And so um, my background is as a wildlife tracker. And so that is my most favorite thing to do in the whole world. So when I'm selecting a camera location, I go out and I'm tracking. I'm looking for the signs that the wildlife have left behind. Um, what I've been taught to call reading the landscape. So really just kind of teasing out these stories um, whether it's footprints or scat or trails or feeding sign, starting to understand how the animals are using the landscape and then locating the camera somewhere that I think we're gonna have really good luck. Um, so I do wanna show you some of the images that have been captured recently. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can you see that? Does that look good? Awesome. Cool. So um, this is probably my favorite photo right now <laughs> that we've captured recently. This is from back in November, and this is a baby mountain lion cub. So this little one is approximately two months old. Um, so just beginning to move around outside of the den with mom. Really incredible. Um, the next one I want to show you is a video. And so this video is an American badger. And I was out on a restoration site tracking and found a fresh sleeping burrow. And this is really exciting news because American badgers are pretty much on the move, um, with the exception of a mom denning with, you know, a, a denning mother. They might stay in one area for longer, but otherwise, these animals might only stay a night or two in a sleeping burrow like this before they're moving on to a new area. So as soon as I saw it, we left the site, we came back with the camera equipment, and I just want to share with you some fun footage that we captured. So yeah, that's food. They're such incredible creatures. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, so I want to share with you a little about my background and how I uh, found myself here in this position. So I actually started my professional career as a farmer. Um, I worked for the junior college. I um, ran my own small farm. And then from there, I became an environmental educator, um, teaching field trips for Sonoma County Regional Parks, um, teaching all over the county, and also doing naturalist interpretation. So taking that you know, love and curiosity of the natural world and, and understanding these stories and being able to share that with others. And I do still teach um, for Sonoma Water currently. And so these are just kind of some uh, logos of different organizations and projects that I have been a part of. Um, my wildlife work has really started in the last five years or so and I discovered tracking and I went in this like deep dive into studying wildlife, studying tracking, studying the ecology, how it all fits together and interacts. And I 
for the Laguna Foundation created and developed their wildlife monitoring project as an unpaid volunteer for about three years before I was hired on to the position that I have now. Um, a little bit about my educational background. I attended the Santa Rosa Junior College, which is just such an incredible local resource. I highly recommend taking some courses there, especially if you're not sure yet what your career pathway might be. It's a wonderful place to learn and find out. While I was at the junior college, I met this incredible woman over here on the right side of your screen, and this is Megan Wallam Murphy. And so Megan Wallam Murphy taught my fish and wildlife conservation course. She introduced me to this world of tracking, and I started following her around. <laughs> um, so I started taking absolutely every class that she was teaching, any workshop that she was offering. Um, I followed her around for enough years that finally I got to ask her to kind of do some one on one teaching with me. Um, we do we still do work trade uh, where I do work for her in exchange for um, the mentorship that she's provided me, which has been really key in my wildlife work. I'm so grateful for her. Um, this is a photo from earlier in the fall when we were out um, doing some tracking for the North Bay Bear Collaborative, which Megan um, started. And so we were collecting bear scat, that is what she's holding. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we were doing DNA analysis um, with this bear scat. So we would collect samples, send them into the lab, and then essentially um, working to build like a bear family tree to understand the genealogy of the black bears in our area and how they're related to each other and where they're dispersing from. Um, so that's really cool. And then I have this other photo on here. This is me um, tracking along the Russian River. And I just wanted to include that because I feel like so much of what I have learned, so much of that educational background has really come from time out on the land and learning from the natural world. In tracking, uh, it's often referred to as dirt time. You gotta do your dirt time. That's the only way <laughs> to progress. Um, and it's called dirt time because I think because um, of the time, literally like hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, looking at the dirt um, and figuring it out. And so I just encourage you all, whatever your path may be, um, wherever you may find yourself to, you know, make sure that you balance your education with that dirt time, whatever that might look like for you. Uh, so that brings me to the project that I'm currently working on. It is called the Copeland Creek Wildlife Corridor Assessment. So I'm looking at the Copeland Creek watershed. That's what this blue line here is. So that's outlining the watershed boundary which is also the boundary of our study area. So Copeland Creek headwaters up here on Sonoma Mountain, drains down the west side of the mountain, and then comes into Lonert Park. Actually goes right by Sonoma State. So the assessment that I'm looking at is, it's looking at Copeland Creek. It is a riparian corridor and the assessment is essentially looking at how are wildlife currently using this area and where are the barriers? Where are the barriers to movement and to permeability? Can we identify them? And then how can we improve them? And so this assessment has essentially four different components that I wanna share with you. So the first one is wildlife cameras. We're using wildlife cameras, like we talked about, to be able to capture images of animals, um, including we will be uh, in this coming year also putting cameras underneath those, underneath road undercrossings to be able to detect which animals are walking up to a road crossing and turning back, which ones are walking under and making it to the camera on the other side. So lots of work with wildlife cameras. A second component of the project is what we call undercrossing structure monitoring, <laughs> um, which is kind of a mouthful, but essentially it is going out and measuring these openings. Um, and there's actually a huge amount of change even just throughout the year. So since we've been doing this project, 
Um, these photos here are showing Snyder Lane in Roanoke Park. Um, and this was in April of 2020. And this is my supervisor, Wendy. And you can see she's standing on all of this sediment and vegetation in the creek bed. And then when we returned in November, this is my wonderful colleague, Annie, out there showing us some scale, um, that what a huge difference. So in this particular instance, this sediment is deposited by the creek in these huge amounts, essentially every year. Um, and the water agency is maintaining this as a flood control uh, channel, essentially a way to prevent flooding for the city of Roanoke Park. So they're having to go in yearly and remove all of this sediment. And so look at what a huge change can occur in an undercrossing just within one year. So that's why we're going out and we're actually measuring how tall is it, how wide is it, and it may not be the same the next time we go out to measure it. <clears throat> um, we're also noting what type of undercrossing it is, whether it's a bridge or a culvert or a box culvert like these and how many sections the box culvert might have. The next component I want to tell you about is the track and sign surveys. So I, um, as you might imagine, love this part of my job, <laughs> getting to go out and do these surveys. So we're documenting wildlife track and sign um, both to determine camera locations, but also to inform data where we can't place cameras. Um, so when we, maybe a location isn't a good spot for a camera, but we can, we can grasp some of that information from doing these surveys. So yes, often it is actual animal footprints like this deer track that we're looking at. Um, but also all kinds of other sign. Um, this is a skull that's actually from an, an opossum, a possum, a possum skull. Uh, <laughs> this is a feather from a great horned owl and cough pellets that it's coughed up with little prey skulls inside. Uh, this is a picture of some scat. So um, skunk is who this, who left this scat in this place. They like to eat lots of insects like these little beetles. Um, and then this photo is of an antler rubbing. So this is the deer, the male deer, the bucks. Um, at a certain time of year, they're actually rubbing the velvet off of their antlers. And so they'll leave sign like this on trees. And then the last component of this project is doing roadkill surveys. Um, so we're actually driving around, um, identifying incidents where animals have been struck by a vehicle and essentially compiling all of this data with the other components of this project. And so when we overlay all of these different pieces, the wildlife cameras, the undercrossings, um, the track and sign surveys, and then these roadkill surveys, we can kind of get a really good picture of how this area is functioning as a corridor, how permeable it is, and really identify those barriers to wildlife movement. So speaking of barriers, um, <laughs> just a little bit of meme fun, but I chose this photo because it's a really good way to see um, what a challenge our road infrastructure can be for wildlife. So this is a photo that's actually from the Netherlands, but this is an incredible matrix of roadways. Um, and we can see that there's habitat on both sides. And so this is what we would call habitat fragmentation. So the habitat has actually been fragmented. It's been separated by this roadway. And that's a problem for wildlife. So what are some solutions? What could we do to help reconnect these habitat areas? So that's what I want to end on is some solutions to these problems. So um, really incredible work is being done all over the world, including creating overpasses like these. Um, so incredible creations, huge infrastructure for animals to be able to move across a roadway without being struck. And there often is also um, 
some fencing or some other type of way to sort of funnel the animals to that area to encourage them to use the overpass. And then the overpass is likely being put in a place that's already been determined to be an animal crossing where they have had challenges. Um, so in addition to creating overcrossings, we can also create or improve existing undercrossings. Uh, this is a grizzly um, that is using an undercrossing up in Banff National Park. So um, even huge animals like the grizzlies can benefit from these types of connectivity. Another easy thing um, that a lot of folks are moving towards is using this wildlife friendly fencing, because you can imagine just as a road is going to be a barrier that fragments habitat, um, fences can have the same effect in a lot of places. And so wildlife friendly fencing, this is just one example. There are a lot of variations, but the idea is that it's keeping usually livestock inside of an area while allowing the wildlife to be able to move through so they can slip under this lower uh, line here that doesn't have barbs on the wire. It's a smooth wire. Um, just a really easy solution to help make these places more permeable. And then um, the last solution I'll talk about today is also just looking at parcels of land. So this photo here, there's this dark green section, and this has been identified as by a study as critical um, wildlife connect connectivity habitat. So it's, it's critical to connectivity. This is a corridor that's been identified. This is actually Copeland Creek. So the purple ones are creeks and this one is Copeland Creek right here. So a good portion of the headwaters of this creek is actually inside this area that's identified as critical for connectivity. And then within that, there's all these parks and preserves and open spaces that have been protected from development. And so another piece is looking at the in-betweens and looking at how can we um, whether that's through easements, conservation easements on private property or additions to public property, how can we keep attaching these little parcels <laughs> together to create these chunks of habitat connected and then we can take those chunks and connect them to other chunks and help them be connected to other chunks until, you know, eventually the goal is that we have these incredible wide, like large scale um, corridors like the Pacific Wild Way or the Western Wild Way where there's actually um, corridor movement allowed to happen from up in Alaska, you know, all the way down into Mexico. So it's important again for the individual animals to be able to move, but also for that genetic variation, for that genetic pool to be able to move across these large landscape areas. So that is the end of my presentation. And I would love to open it up if there's any questions. Wow, your work is so fascinating. And, <laughs> um, especially that, that badger. I, um, have you ever seen one in person? No. I haven't either. Yeah, they're, they're not easy to spot. Yeah. Um, so we have some questions here and um, could you tell us um, what sort of impact um, does vineyard spraying have on wildlife? Um, so that is a really great question um, and probably has a much bigger answer than I will be able to provide, um, but there's a lot of effects. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for any type of agricultural spraying is the runoff. Um, so especially looking at aquatic wildlife is going to have a really big impact from any of those chemicals um, making it into those waterways, which happens quite often. Um, for me personally, I have tracked countless animals that are eating those grapes. Like, I can't even tell you how many, the foxes and the deer and the the black bears and the coyotes, like everyone is sneaking a bite of some of those grapes. And so I would imagine that there is also impacts um, 
especially, you know, over time with that. So that's what I can provide, although I'm sure there's much more uh, info to answer that question. Have you seen any drastic decrease of certain species when you are doing your dirt time? <laughs> Great question. Um, so I haven't personally witnessed a decline of species. What I have been, what I found really interesting with the Copeland Creek corridor work is that um, that that long skinny watershed, right? There's the the headwater section. It's up on the mountain. You're expecting the the mountain lions to be up there, right? There's a certain kind of species that you expect to find in that area. And then there's kind of the middle section and then it goes into that really urban section where um, you're expecting less of like resident animals and maybe more um, movement, although there are gonna be some species that will um, reside there. So what was most surprising to me is there was a certain place that I had from looking at the map that I had expected like this is where I expect to notice this change. So I'm having a hard time kind of <laughs> wrapping my words around this, but there, um, I was walking the creek, starting in the urban section, heading towards Sonoma Mountain. And from my maps, I had thought at this point in the creek, I might notice a change in the pattern. And what surprised me is that that line was in a very different place than where I expected it to be. I expected, there to be a significant change at Petaluma Hill Road, which is sort of like the first big road moving into the urban section. So I was like, here's a line of like, this is really um, sort of more rural. And then this becomes like more urban, more roads. And that wasn't where we detected the change in the wildlife species. It was actually further into the urban area where as you're walking before you get to that road that I described, it was like all of a sudden everybody's here. Where in the more urban sections, we were finding like, you know, house cats and possums and raccoons. And then all of a sudden we hit this spot and it was like, oh, the deer are here and the coyotes are here and the fox and the bobcats. Um, and so what was surprising to me that it wasn't the road that I had kind of hypothesized might be the line, but it was actually the vegetation management along the creek. There was a specific portion of the creek where the vegetation is managed in a different way and allowed to have more vegetation and that was where the line was so I think that might be a little bit of an offshoot of the question but I hope that <laughs> gives you some insight. I think that just answered the next question which was do animals prefer certain areas in the laguna or um, the watershed and it sounds like places with more vegetation yeah, and it'll depend on the species for sure. Um, but when we're talking about like a riparian corridor, um, if there is a section of the creek that really doesn't have any cover or any food or any you know safety to offer, it's going to be a much different um, composition of animals than in other places. Hmm. <clears throat> Do you use the help of volunteers to help document, photograph, or track various species in the parks? Yeah, so um, that is something that is going to be rolling out this year um, because this is a brand new project. We've spent the last year using um, mostly myself, but also a few other staff members to go out and sort of pilot these protocols and see what they might look like and work out some of the kinks and, and kind of write up a this is exactly how to do it so that we can maintain that consistency throughout the study. Hmm. And now that that is all falling into place, it's gonna be time for me to be asking for help <laughs> um, because the, the main area where we'll be utilizing volunteers or interns for this project is gonna be in what we call classifying the data. So looking at the photos from the wildlife cameras and then um, identifying which species it is, how many there are and putting all of that into a spreadsheet. So that's gonna be the biggest area where we will be looking for volunteer support. Um, but I also hope to be able to incorporate some of these other things as well. Um, I think the roadkill surveys is another place where we'll have volunteer support. And then I hope that if you're volunteering to do those things that you also get to come out into the field and see a camera and, you know, participate. So, so if students are interested in this work, how can they get involved? Um, you can, uh, you know, reach out to me, but there's also a bunch of organizations 
that are doing this kind of work throughout the county and utilizing volunteers. So off the top of my head, um, Audubon Canyon Ranch has a Living with Lions project. They have, um, as far as I know, volunteers that are classifying their camera photos. Pepperwood, I believe, is another local organization that utilizes volunteers for this. I'm sure that there's more and maybe I can help um, send out a list or something, um, but you are always welcome to contact me as well. I can provide my email and I can keep you in mind when those opportunities come up. Hmm. What was the most difficult tracking assignment that you had? Mm. That's a really tricky question. Um, <laughs> I think that I've had a lot of difficult tracking assignments. Um, and there's sort of a lot of different ways that tracking could be difficult, right? It could be like a really elusive animal, like a badger, or um, it could be, you know, a, a dangerous area. Um, what comes to mind is that in the urban sections of Bronert Park, there is a lot of um, houseless activity that happens. And unfortunately, there will be, um, I wanna be you know, delicate about this social justice issue, but also share that from my personal experience, um, there, there's a lot of like, used needles and like hypodermics on the ground so from that point as far as a difficult tracking project it was really difficult to be moving through and to be finding these things and also to be able to track the humans just like you would the animals of like where someone was sitting and where someone may have like slid down and laid over you know just just these human behaviors were really um difficult for me to track on a personal level i guess yeah, that was my next question was about tracking humans and whether um, you or anyone you work with has ever um, used tracking to find a, a lost person. So I haven't, but yes, that definitely happens. I have some friends and old colleagues that were in, an, what is it called when? Uh, search and rescue. Wilderness. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, wilderness search and rescue. Yeah, thank you so much, Milo. <laughs> Um, and so absolutely that this tracking these same skills apply to looking for, you know, um, someone that might have been lost. And then also it's, it kind of rolls over to like detective work and police work and really, um, you know, kind of crime scene investigation. I think these skills are transferable to all of those instances. Mm -hmm. um, when the fires affect the environment of the animals, how is your work affected? Mm. Another really good question. Um, I can share that my work personally hasn't been impacted by the fires um, for this, for my work with the Laguna Foundation. Um, I know that many of our, my colleagues and these partner organizations, they are, um, they've had cameras pre and post fire, which is really incredible data to be able to collect. So they've been able to have data sets from before a fire went through. They've had cameras capture the animals while the fire is moving through. Um, they've had capture, they've, I've seen wildlife photos of like the deer coming back in immediately after. Um, but I've also seen cameras that, you know, were melted or, you know, damaged by the fire themselves. And some of that data is lost. But I, I think that, you know, as these wildfires are becoming uh, so regular in our, in our area that we're going to be seeing a lot more. And I, I'm, I mean, I think we're going to be seeing more information coming from people studying before and after. And so the longer that we can study after, um, and if we have that baseline data to compare it to, that's where we're really gonna be able to tease out some of those um, effects. Hmm. Do you ever have to navigate the Laguna by boat for your work? Um, do I have to, or do I get to? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I have been out boating um, on the Laguna, mostly in the main channel and mostly um, in the really heavy rainy flooding seasons. It is a great way to get out and get that the dirt time or water time to get your eyes on what's happening and a fun way to maneuver about. Is it safe for people to say kayak or stand up paddleboard during the winter on the Laguna? It is. Um, I, I haven't seen stand up paddle boarders, but kayaking is very popular. Um, the Laguna Foundation recently had a uh, public program talking about kayaking in the Laguna and kind of giving you some insight into where are good launch locations and what you might, you know, what considerations you might need. Um, but definitely kayaking is, um, is safe and fun. Um, and do you know how many species total live in the Laguna? Oh, I do not. There's so many. Um, so many. Um, Hundreds. If you, okay. <laughs> um, if you could educate every single Sonoma County resident about one topic related to the Laguna, what would it be? Hmm. I like that question. Um, I think I would want folks to know just how incredibly diverse and, um, and unique the Laguna actually is. Um, for you know us, it's like, oh yeah, that's kind of somewhere in Sebastopol. Um, but it actually is a wetland of international importance. It has had that designation because of its incredible vastness, the, the number of species that depend on it, the number of native and endemic plant and animal species that can be found there. And also the um, ecological services that it provides, right? It's a buffer from flooding, it's a collector of sediment, it's so many things. <laughs> um, so I think just knowing that it's there would be the number one thing. And then um, really trying to provide some depth into um, how unique it really is. <laughs>